Like, how do we subvert the government? Like, how do we spread by regional awareness? And uh, so here we are. Thank you, Penny, for coming. It's always sunny in Cascadia, right? So Uh, first, thank you all so much for uh, being out here. I recognize almost every face here, not not everyone, but, but most of you. And most of you over the last nine months, uh, 10 months, have put in so much work uh, to just advocate change in general. And whether you did it through food sovereignty, the bike swarm, the occupation, um, as anti-war activists, or, or, or whatever in your capacity, I can tell that you really want change. Um, I want change. I was going to write this huge uh, speech kind of explaining a people's history of the bioregion, but, but I think instead today, in all honesty, I want to speak as a Cascadian to Cascadians, you know. American history books, it uh, doesn't matter, you know, until you get to probably the uh, university level and specifically the graduate level, are full of what's called American exceptionalism. And if you don't know what American exceptionalism means, it means that America always does the right thing and will continue to do the, always do the right thing and that we have made certain mistakes in the past. These aren't just mistakes. These are, these are genocides. These are, these are, you know, murder of a large scale, of, you know, of an entire people on a large United scale. United States military from 2004, 2008. As a pharmacy technician, uh, I was stationed at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, where it was my Reynolds Army Community Hospital, where I gave out all the deployment medications to soldiers going out, and I took care of their families while they're at home. And I joined as a pharmacy tech because I wanted to be support. I wanted to be able to help people. I wanted to be sure that I didn't join for nationalistic reasons. I joined because I had to go to college. In my town, we had a Walmart and we had a uh, a Rite Aid pharmacy, and I applied to the Rite Aid and. Uh, they weren't hiring. I applied at Walmart, went back for three interviews, and was told I was not Walmart material. And I'm pretty sure to this day that it's because I had hopes and dreams. Yeah. But at that point, it was a pretty low point because if I'm not Walmart material, what kind of material am I? And then I looked up in the parking lot and saw the, you know, Army of One, the billboard up there. I'm like, okay, try it out. Went through maps, went through basic, got to my duty station, and I started doing my job. And my job was, oh, hey, you're not sleeping at night? We can hook you up with some Ambien. Oh, you know, you're. You're not feeling all that great. We got Zoloft, we got Prozac, we got all these different things. You know, we'll make sure you get the right stuff. You know, oh, you're in aches and pains all the time. Here's some Percocet. Here's some Vicodin. Here's some this and that. And I, you know, signed off in the bottle. See what my pharmacist told me to do. And I worked in the hospital, and I lived in the barracks right across from the hospital. So I would do my job during the day, and then go home at night and see all my soldiers coming back who would, you know, be taking their Ambien with their vodka, or taking their Percocet with their Jack Daniels, and who would be, you know, getting, in, you know getting in trouble through domestic violence and car accidents and DUIs and stuff like that. And I like, I, it was my job to give out the pills, but I never asked the questions like, why aren't you sleeping at night? Why are you depressed? Why are you in pain all the time? You know, and when I started asking those questions, I realized it's because we have all the, we, we've been going on this war for about 11, 12 years now, right? Longest war in U.S. history. Uh, and we keep sending these guys out, like, one deployment, two deployments. I know a guy who's been on nine deployments already. And we never give them a chance to recover and heal. And even if a doctor says, hey, maybe this guy shouldn't be out in the field for a, a while, give him a break this time, the general will say, oh, that's nice, and put him back out. And because of this, we lost more soldiers to suicide in 2009, 2010, and 2011 than we actually did to combat. You know, when you actually start talking to vets, and you start like, well, why are they killing themselves? What's going on? And it's because, you know, they get back into the culture, they get, they've been sent off to war to go help fight for democracy and freedom and to, to bring, you know, hope and dreams to all the people in the Middle East. And when they get there, that's not what they're doing. <laughs> and there, there seems to be this huge disconnect between what they're told they're doing and what actually happens. And once you've, you know, had to go bag a few enough dead children, had to go pick up enough pieces of your buddies and stuff like that, you realize that, hey, maybe we're not doing this for the right reasons. Maybe there's something jacked up about this. And uh, so when soldiers get back here, especially to the Oregon area, there's like, no place where they can really identify with other vets outside of, you know, the VA lobby or the American Foreign Legion drinking hall. And that place is more depressed than the VA, if you ask my opinion. And, like, there's there's no sense of community. And they try to talk to the average civilian about it. You know, the questions they get was, oh, hey, did you did you kill anybody while you were there? Yeah, I bet it was hot, you know. <laughs> was it like the Hurt Locker? You know, stuff like that. 
And even I, when I got out, I'm a female vet, I never deployed, and I didn't even consider myself to be a veteran. Like, because I, you know, I wasn't, you know, one of those crazy guys. I didn't go kill anybody. I didn't go do those kind of things. I must, you know, I just did my time and got out. And uh, it wasn't until 2008 that I met up with Iraq Veterans Against the War. And they're like, you know what, as a matter of fact, you are a veteran. And as a matter of fact, you do have stories to share. You do have a voice. And what your voice can do is help, you know, tell the story of what's really going on. And so I became a veteran's advocate. And I went to all the rallies. I did all the marches and stuff like that. And I realized that it's, it's not enough. It's not, not enough just to hold up the sign. It's not enough just to post a blog. It's not enough just to, you know, say I'm against this. I need to actually have something tangible to show for it. So with a group of six other uh, post-9-11 veterans, we created something called the Veterans Transition Corps. And it's our goal to help facilitate a holistic transition from military to civilian life, or some would even say post-military life. Because it's really hard for a lot of my guys to even identify as civilians. Like they, they never feel they're going to be able to fit back in. They're never going to be happy watching a fireworks show. They're never going to be happy talking about Dancing with the Stars. They're never going to be happy just going about normal American culture. And when we were trying to come up with a logo that would, you know, represent who we are, because we didn't want to go the Stars and Stripes route, we didn't feel that was appropriate. We didn't feel like more, what we needed was more nationalism. We wanted to go with a symbol that identified with, you know, we want to take care of our planet. We fought the war on terror, and now we want to fight the war on terror. We want to take care of what we have. You know, we are willing to die for our country, but now we want to live for our planet. And so, yeah. so what, what symbol better, or what symbolizes, you know, self-reliance, independence, having skills that you can share, building community, and just being appreciative of where you live and wanting to protect it, than the wonderful Doug Burr right there. So that's our look. We have it's Veterans Transition Corps around the circle, and the center of it is the Cascadian flag. And I'll let one of my other members, Ben Martin, talk more about that and the Boost the Roots program that we're doing right now. Yeah! Woo! Uh, I uh, participated in the invasion of Iraq and then two more supporting deployments to Asia, actually, where I helped fight terrorism in the Philippines and then keep North Korea in check. Uh, that's a little bit of my background. Uh, after I got out, I realized that, I, like Penny said, I wasn't going to be able to adapt to civilian life. I mean, I will never consider myself a civilian again. Um, I'll never consider myself military again. It's just this weird gray area. It's almost like purgatory. You don't really know where you're at. Um, so I went to the VA, they gave me a round of tests, and they basically slid a form in front of me with one column that said um, symptoms, and then the adjoining drugs on the other side. And so I could just go down the list and, you know, open pharmacy essentially. I, I slid it back to them and told them I didn't want their drugs and I didn't go back to the VA for another year. So uh, I started on a self-destructive path. Uh, a lot of drugs, a lot of all kinds of different things, uh, alcohol, women, whatever. You know, I, I, I try to distract myself as much as possible. And I think that's what a lot of veterans are doing. And uh, those who don't have a support network are the ones that end up popping themselves off. And that is kind of where the veteran, veteran Transition Corps has come into, is that a group of us realize that when shit does hit the fan, which I think we all kind of know is eventually going to happen, whether it's this year, next year, or another five years, uh, the biggest thing to have is a sense of community, uh, tribalism is what I like to think of it as. Uh, because you can prepare all you want, but if you don't have that community around you to support you, you're going to be on your own and you're going you're gonna to die. So. In all reality, it's about establishing a network that you can rely on and you can trust. And so we're out at a property right now on a pilot program, basically learning how to sustain our own life without being a part of the system. Because I feel like the first step in resistance is self-sustainable self living. And so if you can decouple yourself out of the system, then you're one step closer to resistance and revolution. So. Um, that's where I kind of feel like I'm coming from on that. It's, it's an interesting project. It kind of just formulated in the last six months. We, uh, <laughs> we met a couple, uh, I went to one Occupy meeting, met a couple vets. In all honesty, I thought the Occupy movement was, you know, in the right place, but it just didn't have enough oomph behind it. So I decided that, you know, me and a couple other vets will start doing something on our own and try to get a community together on, on, on that term. And so we're out there. And we are basically learning how to make a self-sustaining ecosystem that we can apply in any sort of uh, client or geographic region. So we can apply it to cities with vertical farming or in your backyard and learning how to basically yield 
the most out of the property that you live on. So the importance of this is that we are taking veterans in and we are giving them a sense of community and we're giving them a sense, a sense of purpose once again because that's one thing that we lose when we get out is we have all, I think, have this altruistic duty to serve and then that is gone and it's replaced with uh, opiates and we, you know, we, we start losing our minds. So by giving veterans a place to feel like they're um, serving again is our, is our main goal. So uh, you can find us on Facebook uh, forward slash Veterans Transition Corps. Uh, that's kind of where we're posting a lot of our doings. Uh, you're welcome to come out to the farm and take a look and see what we're doing. We're, right now we're actually digging a duck pond that we can use the fertilizer for to water our garden. And then we're also planting a barn right now. Barn? A straw uh, barn. Yeah. A straw barn. Uh, and we got several other things in the works as well. Um, hopefully this uh, this takes off and it becomes a little sanctuary not only for veterans but for uh, Cascadia as well. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>